Good morning. Welcome to the good ship Mayflower. It is the beginning of Lent, and so we're going to start with a very important confession for us. We offer a warm welcome, of course, to this place, but we remember also that the land on which we meet is, was, and always will be American Indian land. We acknowledge those indigenous tribes to Oklahoma, to Oklahoma the Wichitas, Caddo's, Plains Apaches, and the Quapaws as the original custodians of the land in this place. And we remember with shame and sorrow those driven from their land by the Indian Removal Act of 1830 across the Trail of Tears, the Choctaw, Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole people. We offer respect to all tribal elders past and present, to all the indigenous peoples of the earth from whom we have so often stolen land, native tongues, and native culture. We ask forgiveness, and we will not forget to say this and to mean it. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. bow our heads together. Lord of life, we begin the journey of Lent and we wonder, what should we give up? We have more than most people, but it's hard to decide what we can live without, or should we say, live better without. We could make changes to our diet, that would be good. We could exercise more, that would be good. We could try to keep our temper under control or give up some other bad habit, that would be good. Or perhaps we could think about something bigger, deeper, something closer to the heart, like, let's give up ingratitude for Lent. Let's not sacrifice something. Let's reorient our whole self so that we are not just thankful for every day or for those around us or for this church, but so we become people who live so completely inside gratitude that we are grateful for life itself. Let's think of everything we have as a gift, as in everything, every breath we draw, every bite of food we eat, every moment we experience. Let's consider it all a miracle beyond deserving until we become a person who lives inside thankfulness so completely that we can't think of a single thing that we deserve. Not come ye thankful people come, but be ye thankful people be. Let's begin right now with the next breath we draw, the next face we see, the next moment in this church we love. And for Lent we promise, we promise, to stop trying to figure out what anyone deserves, much less what we deserve. It is all grace. It is all gift. It is all the unbearable lightness of being. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning comes from Deuteronomy, the 26th chapter, verses 1 through 11. When you have gone into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it, and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armenian was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there 
as an alien, few in number, and then he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. And it's Aramean, not Armenian, just, just to be clear. <laughs> it makes a little difference, but here ends the reading inspired by God. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Tradition holds that on the first Sunday of Lent, we are to read the story of Jesus 40 days in the wilderness from one of the gospels. We do this because Lent is modeled on Jesus 40 days in the wilderness. All but the gospel of John tell of the episode just after Jesus' baptism. Matthew and Luke's retellings are detailed, the temptations and tests Jesus faced spelled out one, two, three, but bless Mark, he can always be counted on to give us just the facts, ma'am. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. There it is. But the text from Deuteronomy puts us in the wilderness too, albeit in a roundabout way. Up until the verses we read, the book of Deuteronomy is essentially statutes and ordinances intended to shape a particular way of living. Not everyone is gung-ho about the book of Deuteronomy. For certain, parts of Deuteronomy have been used as a weapon against the queer community and women but, to be frank, doing so is lazy and unfaithful. It's lazy insofar as it involves no biblical scholarship or discernment and unfaithful in that we are to use love to interpret scripture, not scripture to interpret love. But this particular passage makes love seem Pretty straightforward, the text tells of God's landless people on the verge of crossing into the land of promise. They are given a lengthy set of instructions to help them build and settle, but in the middle of those instructions, a prescription for preventative care is included, for there is great danger when migrants settle and begin to prosper. People tend to contract to think small and selfishly and are willing to settle for less than the vision of hope for liberation and justice for all, which was what inspired them to head toward the promised land to begin with. The dispossessed become the possessors. And the next thing you know, people start proposing English-only laws, decreasing the number of visas available, and building walls. So. What is the best way to inoculate against this mindset of scarcity? Build a bigger table. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place. Then you together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. That's God's plan. The community was not only to remember in its thanksgiving what is owed to God, but it was also to renew its sense of community solidarity by ensuring that everyone shared in the abundance. Build a bigger table. 
Of particular note is the specific reference to how aliens are to be treated. Aliens, also known as sojourners or strangers or in our time, undocumented folk. It is the perfect scripture to use for a sermon on immigration justice. And given the anti-immigrant sentiment in our country, it is certainly a timely text. We love to quote Ronald Reagan's description of America as a shining city upon a hill whose beacon light guides freedom-loving people everywhere, but only as long as they don't want to come here for freedom. It's difficult to see this administration's impact on legal immigration to the United States because it's impossible to see an absence what we do know is that there's been a 73% drop in refugee resettlement in the U.S. since 2016. In 2018, under 22,000 refugees were resettled in the U.S., not even half of the 44,000 44, cap the U.S. set for that year. And this year, the administration set the maximum number of refugees who can make this home at just 30,000. This is immoral given that over 260,000 refugees were awaiting processing in the summer of 2018. And then there's the situation at our southern border, which is same song, 22nd verse. We are literally leaving people in the wilderness. But it's 2019, so I mean, really, does Deuteronomy apply to us? That may have been what those who heard this text originally asked, too. Biblical scholarship says that Deuteronomy was formed in all likelihood through a complex process that reached at least from the 8th century to the 6th century and spanned three significant periods in the history of Israel. Which means, though, that the words of this book were spoken to the people of God in sharply different circumstances. When they had not yet received the abundant gifts and prosperity of the land and only knew the wilderness, and then again when they had lived long in the land, enjoying and being accustomed to all the benefits of that land, and then three, when the good gifts of God, the, the land and its an abundance and even a temple had been completely lost, Thus, the book is, by necessity, engaged in a significant hermeneutical endeavor, speaking to new situations in light of the past, new situations that might be very different from previous ones. And this is true for the ancient Israelites and for us. Reverend Jan Rippentrop reminds us that this particular part of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11, was written and revised in the historical framework of the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. The Israelite people were under pressure to maintain faithfulness and political autonomy in the face of growing Babylonian and Assyrian threats. In Deuteronomy 26, the people are aware of this unsettled and frightful present that they are in. So they use one of the most powerful tools to get them through. Memory. Memory can be a dangerous thing, of course. It can trick us into thinking that there was such a thing as the good old days, and it's easy to get stuck wishing for the past, but as Bill Coffin wrote, memory, properly used, is like a running broad jump. It takes you back, only to launch you further forward. And this was the hope of the text we read this morning. It calls on the long collective memory of the power of God's presence in the lives of the Israelite ancestors. When the Egyptians, remember, treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice, saw our affliction, our toil, and, and our oppression. Theologian David Kelsey, in his book, Imagining Redemption, wrote, Redemption from old situations is remembered so that redemption from current situations can be anticipated. Thus, under the pressure of social upheaval, Israel turned to historic covenants, prayers, and they remembered God's previous saving acts in order to anticipate God's future saving acts. 
But it's not just memory the Israelites relied on for inspiration. They actually turned that memory into a creed. Notice that the text is given in the context of worship. The people were to gather the first of all the fruit of the ground, bring it to the priest, and then recite a creed. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall say this, a wandering Armenian was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien. And then it goes on to recall the lives and experiences of the fathers and mothers of Israel. What is remembered, though, is that they wandered. They wandered. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. They did not have a place. They did not have a land. And their beginning was very different from their ending. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. This Aramean in the text is usually identified as Jacob, but it's possible no one specific individual is intended since it is the landless condition of the desert wanderer that is highlighted. Our tradition story of God is populated almost exclusively by landless wanderers. We are reminded that Abraham and Sarah were immigrants who left their home and became resident aliens. Then there was Joseph with his coat of many colors, tangled in family drama, sold off, then trapped for years, whose traumatic journey ultimately gained him legal status. But then eventually his descendants were enslaved. But one of them risked everything to give her tiny baby a chance by turning him over to the government. That baby grew up to be Moses, who would eventually lead his people, a caravan of desperate refugees, on a desert trek toward freedom. They wandered in exile for 40 years, resident aliens all. But even after all that wandering, they did eventually come into the land. This creed that begins, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor, is a reminder of suffering, deliverance, and blessing. To remember that experience and to tell that story is what it means to confess one's faith. This is their story and our inheritance. So this morning, I suggest we spend the 40 days of Lent reciting reciting this creed. I know what it is to say, let's recite a creed to a non-creedal people. (laughs) This is Mayflower, like many UCC congregations, a church of immigrants, some might say religious refugees, many of us here because creeds have been used as a weapon, the same as scripture. Around here we get a, a little itchy about creeds. The United Church of Christ is a non-creedal denomination, or to use our language, we are a covenantal denomination, meaning there isn't a centralized authority or hierarchy that can impose any doctrine or form of worship on its members. We work to balance freedom of conscience and accountability with our inherited faith tradition. We take seriously the Apostle Paul's urging to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So when it comes to creeds, we receive the historic creeds and confessions as testimonies of faith, not tests of faith. So it is that I am willing to propose a creed to this non-creedal bunch, a creed to help us remember who we are. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor which is to say that we trust we will come through. We come from folk who wandered in the desert for 40 years. So put one foot in front of the other. Do the next right thing. You are not alone. Keep going. Hold the vision of the promised land. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor 
which is to say that we recognize our obligation to build a bigger table and then bring our first fruits to it so that others can share in abundance, whether they be those Levites, aliens, conservatives, the spiritual but not religious, that annoying coworker, liberals, or as we say in this place, gay, straight, transgender, married, bisexual, single, queer, separated, questioning, lesbian, divorced, or considering any of the above. We are elbow to elbow at a bigger table. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor, which is to say that even if we were to lose everything, we hold unswervingly to the hope we profess there is restoration, there is reconciliation, there is resurrection. Our job is to bring what we have in thanksgiving and share it because we know there is enough. And if you are one of the wandering Methodists here this morning, this creed is a reminder particular to you that God is faithful even when we're not sure how we will come out of it or where we are supposed to be, God is faithful. We know because a wandering Aramean was my ancestor. So this Lent, instead of giving something up, adopt this creed. Tape it to your bathroom mirror. Let it be the first thing you read in the morning and the last thing at night, and then live into everything it means. Remember that we are not the first to wander, and let us bring everything we have been given and earned to the table to share. Trust that God is faithful to bring us through. Now let us be on our way. The wilderness awaits.